my advice would be to recognize your vulnerabilities and do what you can to put in place the supports that you'll need now rather than later because when the situation happens it's too late Barry. So uh, yeah, I'm Jen Tickle and I'm the secondary principal at Dresden International School where I've been for two years. I've been teaching internationally since 1995, mainly in uh, the Americas and Southeast Asia. And I wanted to share a personal story actually about an aspect of my leadership journey um, and I hope that you can extrapolate something from it that's of use to you. I'm a very openly emotional person, which I firmly believe is a superpower, but I also think it can be um, a weakness, particularly if as a leader, you're trying to be in control and show that you're in control. Um, in 2011, I was MYP coordinator at an international school in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and we had a terrible electrical fire um, that was very visible for the whole school community. It left one service staff member seriously wounded, another fighting for his life and another sadly died. It was a really traumatic situation um, and I was completely traumatized, very befuddled and panicked. But as a member of the middle leadership team, people were kind of looking to me for some leadership and I had no idea what to do. Everybody else on the leadership team seemed to know what they should be doing and was busy being in control. And I just wasn't. Um, feedback I had afterwards was that my attempt to help the situation actually undermined some of the more perhaps professional and thought through um, helping scenarios um, and I wasn't very useful. So I took that on board and decided that that was something that I really needed to learn from because if I was going to be a successful leader, um, number one, people were going to be turning to me in times of crisis to be an in-control leader. Number two, I clearly didn't actually have the emotional control at that point to be that leader. And number three, no one was going to be helping me with this. I needed to kind of figure it out for myself. So um, first thing I did was I thought back to my time in Thailand when the tsunami happened and the school that I was working at asked us to come into school to phone families to really establish the level of loss within our community. Now, clearly, we weren't qualified to, to do that. And so what they did was they gave us scripts. They'd been written by the counsellors and those scripts allowed us to be very professional, very on message, still be human and still be caring. But it gave us that little bit of space in what was a really deeply difficult conversation to have with families. And I thought, what a good idea, what an emotional support that was for us. So that was learning number one. And then I did a CIS visit to a school and I realized that as part of their emergency management plan, every member of the SLT had a clipboard and a high vis jacket. And on the clipboard were a number of pieces of paper and each one was a scenario, earthquake, shooter, um, fire. And each member of the SLT had their role listed on there. And again, I thought, what a great idea. So even if the majority of your brain is in a panic state, you know what your job is and you're part of a thought through jigsaw puzzle that will make things work, even if you're not consciously um, trying to make those decisions, because who can at that time, right? Um, the pandemic started and I was okay with that kind of situation, but I knew that if we were to going to have as a school an individually traumatic situation, I needed to really be practicing how I was gonna handle my own emotional response so that I didn't let other people down. I spoke to a friend who actually um, is a crisis manager for a big pharmaceutical company in Germany and asked him what they do. And he said they practice scenarios so that even though they could never accurately predict what was going to happen, the chances were that they practiced something similar. And so were at least fairly well prepared. And so that's what I did. I gathered resources and I practiced scenarios. And as the pandemic went on, I, I, I gathered those scenarios and those thoughts and those ideas and resources um, in, my, in my folders. January 21, we were in a pretty dark place as a school. Um, we'd, I think we'd all suffered some kind of personal loss over the holiday. The kids were in lockdown. Um, I was the only member of the SLT who wasn't actually in quarantine. It was a pretty dark time. And very early one morning, my phone rang and it was uh, the parent of a grade nine student who called to tell me that um, his son had died in his sleep. And it was just it was just devastating. And I knew that I, I can't even really talk about it now. I knew that I had to park my own emotional response, you know, as, as a parent, as, as just a human. I had to put it to one side. And I knew that this was the situation that I'd been preparing for. I had 45 minutes before everybody came online. I locked my office door and I went to my folders and I got out my action plans. And I didn't have exactly that action plan, but I had enough resources to prepare the scripts, to plan the scenarios, to do the task lists, because I knew that other people like me would want to be able to do something to help. 
We got it all prepared. I organized the timeline of the communications and then I put the plan into action. And it worked, it was successful. Um, importantly, it meant that as a community, we were able to handle the situation with sensitivity and grace. Um, and for me, I was able to be a, a caring and compassionate leader, but process my own emotional response in private at a more appropriate time. So really my pearl is the realization that sometimes we find ourselves in situations that there aren't workshops for or books about, and that really test our weak spots. And my advice would be to recognize your vulnerabilities and do what you can to put in place the supports that you'll need now rather than later, because when the situation happens, it's too late. <laughs>